Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey, folks, it's Shay here, and today we are going to be visiting with Shelby Cornelius and Zeb Gray about nutrition when it comes to weaning and receiving calves. And so we're going to dive into some things that cattle producers need to keep in mind, some specific products to think about, and it'll be a great conversation about that today. Before we dive into that, I just want to let you know that I am opening my group coaching for podcasts. And what we're going to do is we're going to take you from that podcast idea all the way to a launch in six weeks. So if you are interested in that, message me on Facebook or go to my website and find the contact me page, send me an email, and I will get back to you right away and we will get you registered. So with that, let's get on with the conversation today. All right. Well, Zeb, Shelby, it is great to have you on the podcast today. And we're going to be talking a little bit about nutrition when it comes to weaning time because, um, well, I guess this episode comes out in August, but it's important to be thinking about that kind of year round and producers are going to be starting to think about that, I guess, depending on where they're at in the country. So before we dive into that topic, would each of you introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about what your role in the beef industry is today and kind of how you fit into the industry? Zeb, let's start with you. Uh, Okay. Thanks for having us, Shay. Um, currently, I serve as a technical um, service rep for a company called Diamond V. Uh, Diamond V is based out of Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And that's where our manufacturing plant is. And so day to day, I work and call on uh, nutritionists at different feed companies and then support them in their field with their customers how to best use our product, which is a feed additive. Uh, but prior to that, um, it's, it's been about five years uh, doing nutrition work for producers And before that, I was at the University of Wyoming. Uh, Personally, I run some cows with my uh, family uh, at nights and on the weekends. So uh, I kind of live and breathe beef cows. Well, that's good to hear. Shelby, how about you? What's your role in the beef industry today? Well, I'm Shelby Cornelius, and I'm a district sales manager with Vitalix and kind of serve the upper Midwest. Uh, Been here for about three and a half years now. And... uh, and outside of Vitalix, raised some few black Angus cows at home, and uh, live in Northeast Iowa. That's awesome, and we can dive a little bit more into that later in the conversation. And I sure appreciate Vitalix being a partner of this podcast, um, and some great products too. So as we kind of dive into the topic of today, you know, I want to talk a little bit about weaning and stress. So as a whole. If stress isn't really managed properly, what negative impacts are we going to see on calves around the weaning period? Well, the most severe negative impact would be death. Um, If stress isn't managed, uh, and that ultimately stress usually leads to sickness and um, they can culminate in death if, if severe enough. So uh, I would say most ranchers and cattlemen, though, you know, are pretty experienced. And so it's not like we deal with train wrecks in every group of calves every year, but uh, we still do. We still uh, we still have to deal with it at times. Um, probably the, the biggest profit robber, though, is just those cattle that still get sick, even when we're, you know, trying to manage stress and the problem with with stress and sickness is that when an immune response is prompted in that animal, it is a very energy demanding event, meaning that uh, basically all the energy that that calf is consuming through the diet is going to go towards that immune function and to try to fight off that that sickness or fight off that stress. And uh, ultimately, we don't make money uh, when the calf is going through that process because we make money by putting pounds on. And usually if they're sick or if they're stressed, they're not putting pounds on. So in my, I guess my opinion, just going along with what Zeb said there, stress isn't being handled correctly. We can see a multitude of negative impacts. Um, animals breaking with illness, which is often res- going to result in money either being wrapped up with a vet um, or getting a VFD to get those cattle turned around. Cattle can go off a of feed. Um, producers were often, often going to see, uh, you know, a negative implica- implications uh, by a drop in performance at the bunk in terms of average daily gain and the increase of their vet bill. Um, so, 
all things that can uh, add costs, whether it's time or needing vaccines or anything like that. That's that's all an extra expense. And it's not fun to see any calves sick either. So um, since we're going to focus on the nutrition side of things today, what can cattle producers do? We're going to talk about before and during weaning, but let's talk about before weaning now from the nutrition side. What can cattle producers do to set those calves up for success before the weaning period? Well, I think but if, it's, if you're talking before the weaning period, you know, it's mostly going to be focused on that cow and making sure that uh, she had adequate nutrition pre-calving um, because if that calf failed to get the passive transfers of antibodies through that colostrum, um, it really is a challenge the rest of that calf's life to, to catch up. And matter of fact, they're about five times more likely to die before weaning if they don't get those, um, those antibodies through the colostrum. So, you know, that's not just right before weaning. That starts uh, six, seven months prior to the weaning process, but that, that one is key. And then from there, um, you know, making sure that, that that pair has adequate nutrition, that she's milking adequately and keeping that calf um, um, going. And then as we get closer to the weaning process, obviously that calf's probably going to be consuming its own forage. And so you want to make sure that, uh, you know, there's just adequate forage um, available. And I would uh, stress um, clean water as well. Uh, water is one of the most important things that uh, it is the most important thing when it comes to nutrition and is often the most easily overlooked. So um, I think those would be my focuses pre-weaning. Mm -hmm. And to add along with what Zeb said there, um, oftentimes I'm, when I'm talking to cattle producers, even the month up to weaning those calves, I think it's important to make sure we're giving those calves products just to help kind of prime the pump, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, in terms of just making sure those calves have a healthy gut um, and strong rumen intact before we, we pull them off those calves. Yeah, so let's talk about the even the product side a little bit more. So I want to go back to pre-calving and then we'll come back and talk about that kind of month before weaning too. So pre-calving, if we're looking at products and nutrition, what are you kind of recommending for producers to have for those cows to make sure that they have the nutrition that's going to be transferred into that colostrum and that milk? Well, I'll jump in here and Shelby can talk about some of the additive side, but um, the main, you know, the, the main thing is energy. Um, we got to make sure that that cow has enough energy um, to, to produce those antibodies, produce that milk. And oftentimes uh, protein is really important, but when it comes to supplementing protein to a cow, uh, we really supplement protein so she can eat more feed and get more energy. Um, and then when it comes to vitamins and minerals, you know, those things are super important. Um, and, and we got to make sure to, to pay attention to that. But uh, if our cows are in poor body condition score, you know, usually that is a lack of energy consumption and that has long lasting effects on that, on that pair. Mm -hmm. Yep. Couldn't agree more. And to go along with that, you know, pre-calving um, at Vitalix, we kind of like to use our number 10 breed back tub. And we even have an elite breed back tub that would have full rates uh, of Avela 4 from Zinpro, as well as Diamunit, which is organic selenium, uh, Nature Safe, and XPC Ultra Yeast from our friends at Diamond V. Um, and that breed back tub is, you know, has the added fat, extra added fat and protein to help kind of push those cows, <clears throat> so to speak, through that, you know, I always uh, recommend the last trimester through about 60 days post calving, uh, just to set them up for success. You know, uh, that's the most crucial part of their year, essentially, to deliver a healthy calf and to heal up and turn around and get bred back within 80 days. There's a lot we're asking for them. Um, so we try to uh, give them all we got, so to speak, in that time period. Absolutely. It definitely is um, a lot we're asking, but also very important, especially as we're looking at keeping a, a tight calving interval too. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, Shelby, you mentioned um, getting some product out there, maybe even like, you know, a month, six weeks before weaning. So those calves kind of get used to it a little bit. What does that look like? What are you seeing work for producers there? Yeah, um, honestly, you know, when I'm working with our dealer network, our dealers going out on farms, those guys that are able to put out uh, our kickstart weaning tub 
which I guess I always kind of call it a souped up stress tub, if you will, because of the nature safe and the Vela 4 in it really pushes the meter down. Um, just getting those calves ready to go. Um, most those, you know, they've already done their, their, uh, uh, their, their pre shots. And, uh, now they're in that, that, uh, three week period there. And they got those kickstart tubs on those calves. When they do pull the calves off those mama cows, uh, the calves already know what the tub is and they're used to it. So you're not hitting that, that window there when we all know how it is. If you wean a group of calves and they're not used to something, they're bawling, they're walking the pen, they're looking for their mom. Um, they already see the tub out there. They know what it is. They keep going up and uh, hitting that, which of course we all know lick tubs uh, produce uh, saliva, which helps peak uh, their appetite to go to the bunk and have that water and that, and that uh, uh, ration that's being provided to those calves to keep them functioning on all cylinders. Zeb, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, I would just add that, you know, at the end of the day, if if we can just have one, we, if we can minimize um, the occurrence of new events at one time, that works really well. And so to Shelby's point, if, you know, if we can do something pre-weaning to introduce them to a new feed stuff or to, to up their basal nutrition levels through a tub, uh, which are, you know, super convenient for uh, cow calf men come weaning time you know then we're just focused on removing that that calf from the cow and, and it already knows how to do certain things and and so yeah uh, i think the old adage uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure uh, applies very well here so what about during the weaning period you know you put the pre-work in but you wean the calves now what what can producers do nutritionally to keep those calves on the right track and help with their animal health too. Cause in my mind, animal health is also impacted by nutrition too, right? It's all tied together. So what can they do? Well, I'm going to re re-emphasize water and uh, Shay, I know your podcast, you're located in the West. And, and so it may be even more critical to, to folks close to you in that, um, you know, the rumen is about, 85 88 percent water right and so if the calf isn't drinking that fermentation that needs to occur for them to utilize feedstuffs is not going to work very well so not only are they going to be dehydrated themselves but their their apparatus to to get nutrition out of feedstuffs is not going to work and in western environments um you know lots of times um, if they re rely on live water through a, a stream or a, a creek or river or something, and all of a sudden you put them in a pen with the water in this box in the corner, uh, sometimes you can really struggle to get those calves to seek that out. And so oftentimes the easiest thing there is just to have, let that thing overflow for a little bit, but clean water, easily accessible, I think is really key. Um, I think Shelby talked about the tubs and, you know, the cool thing about a tub is it's movable. So, putting that tub where those calves want to hang out in the pen uh, and just make it super easy for them to, to run into is, is really, uh, is a really good idea. And then beyond that, I, I would just encourage people to certainly work with a nutritionist to make sure that the ration that they're um, providing, and uh, that can be a mixed ration, it can be a, a supplement in addition to a free choice forage or something, but that it's, adequate in terms of energy, in terms of protein, and in terms of vitamins and minerals. Um, that'll solve a lot of problems right there is if, if you, if we make sure that total um, nutritional program is adequate to what those calves need at that stage. Mm -hmm. So do producers who are selling right off the cow versus producers who are backgrounding for a bit need to be managing differently on the nutrition side or do you kind of think this advice fits all both scenarios? Um, well, the, the guy that's selling right off the cow, um, you know, if he's truly selling right off the cow, uh, I would say his main thing that he needs to manage from a, from a profit side of things is his shrink. And so that would be, you know, not, not separating the cow and calf two days before you're going to haul them in the sale barn. I mean, it really needs to be a fresh gather and, and as close to the sale time as possible. And then um, when you take them to the sale barn, hopefully, you know, they're not going to sit there in the barn for a, another day or something, right? We want to, 
th those producers would want to market them, you know, as close to when they pull them off the cow as possible. Now, long term, um, I would say those things we already talked about a minute ago, you know, if those calves aren't set up nutritionally to go on to that next producer or that next stage, uh, long term, it'll probably affect, you know, the demand for his calves next year. And so I don't want to say just because you're selling off the cow doesn't make it any more any less important to do all those things right. Uh, but my point would be is if you're selling off a cow, managing your shrink around the time of sale is, is super important. And then of course the guy that's going to wean them and background them uh, or, or maybe even just precondition them for 30 days, you know, those things would, that we just mentioned to here a second ago would be very applicable to that producer. And to go along, just to add to what Deb said there, I mean, as a producer selling right off the cow, my advice to that person, the other things you can do just to try to help yourself, set yourself up for success with those cattle, keep them on those products that are going to have a, uh, an ROI, like the Avela 4, the Nature Safe, uh, pounds pay, right? And so giving them those products that are proven to help with weight gain um, and overall performance and, uh, you know, and a, an immune, strong immune response and a healthy gut. That's what's going to make the difference for that gentleman versus someone who's not using those products. Um, and like what Zeb said, that's going to affect who wants to buy those cattle from that person next year. That's a great, that's a great point. Um, when, when you asked that question, I was thinking just right around the sale process, but uh, what Shelby just mentioned, you know, if you're going to sell right off the cow, I mean, that is your paycheck. And so you really probably need to be thinking about nutrition you know, 60 days prior to that date, not just the week of. And um, if you go with, you know, a, a tub like Vitalix or, you know, maybe even some creep feed, something like that. If you're, if you're going beyond and above and beyond to set that calf up for the next stage, um, that really, you need to make that known at the sale barn, right? You need to make that auction barn know that uh, make it known to the buyers that hey these calves I, I went to the extra effort to to set them up and they're ready to go and so that might not be a necessarily uh, they're going to weigh a whole lot more but they might just bring more per pound because the buyers know that that's a marketing issue probably more than a nutritional issue at that point mm -hmm. so i know we we had you on here to talk about nutrition but you opened up the marketing door so who do they talk to at the barn to relay, relay that message? Is that the barn owner, manager? Um, how do they connect with buyers directly to make sure that that information is accurately displayed about their calves? I've had customers uh, talk to the sale barn manager who's up also at the auction block that day. And they give, you know, uh, give them a piece of paper with everything they've done to set those cattle up. And uh, they make sure they announce that when those cattle come in the ring. And that's uh, been beneficial for those customers. Yeah, I, I don't know if it's the manager or the owner, but to Shelby's point, whoever's on the auction block, you know, those cattle need to be represented. And that, and that probably is, you know, represented with their shot schedule, with the additional nutrition that they've offered, um, when, they were, when they were castrated or if they were castrated, probably some genetic history. And, uh, you know, if you ever watch sales on the internet through the different barns, and a set of calves come in and the, and the guy in the auction block's like, I don't know what to tell you. Here they are. They weigh this amount. Um, usually it's a pretty short sale. Yeah. So you two have touched on kind of different additives and components of different products in a diet, but I do want to kind of go back to that and ask it as more of a direct question. So as a whole, what do producers need to be looking for? when they're selecting products, tubs, other minerals, whatever it may be. I mean, Zeb, I know you made a great point about working with a nutritionist. And I think that's really important for all cattle producers because we can't be experts in everything, but what does the cattle producer need to understand and know about the different components of products? Well, I think, uh, you know, it, it probably does get a little challenging to to identify each additive in a particular supplement, but um, my overall recommendation is you know make sure a product has some research behind it, um, and that can be you know total number of studies or the length of time it's been around, but but you do want to have some research. And Shelby mentioned uh, a second ago about ROI or return on investment. 
you you probably want to see um, some economics attached to those research studies that if I spend, you know, this many cents per head per day, um, you know, what does it take to earn that back? Or what is my expected return over that, over that cost? And so, yeah, there's a, there's a lot, there's certain, the feed additive business is a crowded space and, uh, you know, at Diamond V, um, we're celebrating our 80th year this year. We, we pride ourselves on research. Um, I think we're over uh, close to 350 journal publications and peer-reviewed research in addition to all of our field studies and, and uh, lab studies. So um, I would say, you know, just you, you want to have a, an idea of what the research is behind the product and some of the claims that are, are made with the product. And then, you know, how best to utilize it? Where, where does it fit um, best in your operation? And that's probably part of the conversation with a, with a salesman or, or with a nutritionist. Shelby, do you have anything to add? Yeah. And as a producer, uh, going along with what Zeb said there about looking for things that have, you know, research and data behind it, return on investment as a cattle producer, you may want to consider an organic mineral source. Um, what does that look like? Um, what kind of products to look for products that are going to have an impact on your, on, um, on gut health, um, immune response, those kinds of things. And, and it's all, I think it's also really valuable for a producer to know, do you have any deficiencies in your soils, um, out your pastures that are going to come back to haunt you down the road? Um, I know, uh, quite a few producers in certain parts of the Midwest that are deficient in millennium. Um, so using the Diamune product from Diamond V, uh, for an example, um, has come in really handy for those guys to avoid things like white muscle disease. So, why why did you say to look at the inorganic product? Is that what you said? Why organic? For organic minerals, chelated okay. minerals. Okay. Why why is that important? More bio um, bioavailable to the to the ruminant versus not right. So, um, getting again that performance out of them. Um, a better return on investment versus a mineral that might not be as organic. Um, Zeb, do you have, can you help me out on that one? You bet. So when, when he talks about organic uh, minerals, you know, the word organic just simply means uh, carb, you know, it, it contains carbon, right? But uh, my little, my little take on that is the rumen is a very hostile environment. And so if you put a, a naked mineral into the rumen, the microbes are really good about grabbing that, utilizing it in their reproduction process or breaking it down into some other form. And all of a sudden, you know, you're putting mineral into this animal's diet. And because these are ruminant animals, um, the animal is not necessarily benefiting from it. Uh, now, there's a there's some argument that they still need a lot, you know, they still need some inorganic mineral, but uh, what's been common here um, in the past is for companies to take that, take a mineral and chelate it to something. And usually it's a carbon containing source. Uh, I would say uh, amino acids are probably the most common here. Um, but by binding that, that uh, mineral to an amino acid, it protects it. It binds it in a way that the, the, the microbes in the rumen are not, uh, are not able to break it down. And so what ends up happening is the, the mineral will get through the rumen to the lower gut. And then because it's bound to an amino acid, um, the animal will actually absorb the mineral through the amino acid pathway, which is a much, much more efficient process than through a mineral pathway. And so um, I, maybe I should sell minerals, but uh, really, that what they're doing is the chemistry. The chemists are hijacking some of that process to help get mineral in there more efficiently and get it through that rumen, so it is available to the animal. I appreciate you both going through and explaining that a little more because I know that has been kind of a. I've talked about it on one of my rancher mind calls before, and that was kind of one of the big things: is what do all these words mean? Why do they matter? You know, when we're looking at mineral tags, products in general. So I appreciate you going through and explaining that here on the podcast as well. So kind of thinking big picture, and I want to hear both of your responses. If each of you had like 
your own magic wand and you could change any one thing about how cattle producers manage during the weaning and receiving period, what would you change and why? Uh, my answer, and, and I don't know if I could say it was common, but the biggest wrecks that I see is somebody that, and maybe I kind of mentioned this, like with the guy that's going to sell out the cow, short wean calves, you know, something between five days and, and really even 30 days. Um, those are the biggest wrecks I see in the feedlot sector where it just seems like either get them off the cow one day and sell them the next, or you better hold on to them for 30 days and probably even better 45 days. And it, and what I said earlier about the fewer disturbances we can introduce at one time, the better. Um, I just would really discourage short wean calves that, um, you know, are between that window of one day and, and 30 days because it just does not seem to work out um, very well in the calves favor from my experiences. What about you, Shelby? If I could change anything, I wish I could uh, change mindsets a little bit of the, the there's some out there that it don't do anything to set their calves up. Um, there's no, you know, whether that's a stress tub or, you know, they were using some kind of a transition, a nice transition during that, that uh, weaning, that weaning period um, or even creep fit, creep feed. Um, they just pull them off the cows and here we go. And, and the, the dangerous words of this is how we've always done it doesn't work. And uh, it's not a matter of if it's when the training wreck comes. Um, and on the day's market price on what a calf is worth, I think it's worth the investment to make sure we're, we're giving them everything we can to set them up for success. Absolutely. And I think one of the last year I did a um, whole mastermind Q and a series between beef producers and cattle cattlemen. And one of the things we talked about um, was that sometimes what's right for the calf isn't always easiest for the human, but it's worth it to set those calves up for success, no matter what you're doing. So I guess with that, before we kind of wrap up today, do either of you have any parting thoughts or final thoughts that you want to share, whether that's um, about weaning products, whatever it may be? You know, if there's one thing I would try to take away from today, um, those cattle that are going to be consuming products like Nature Safe, XPC Ultra Yeast, and Avela 4, uh, you know, those products are known to help um, immune response, a healthy gut. Uh, increased weaning weight, reduced morbidity, and the bottom line is you're going to have stronger, healthier, and heavier calves at sale time, and that's what's going to, you know, make it or break your fall. So, Nature Safe is a product that you guys have mentioned a couple times. Can one of you explain a little bit about what that is, so that those listening have a better understanding of what we're talking about? Sure. Um, so, Nature Safe is what we call our uh, next generation product. And uh, before I explain next generation, probably take a just a brief second here and explain what uh, first generation is. Um, in, in the industry, if, if you've heard of Diamond V, oftentimes we just get referred to as Diamond V yeast. And we'll take that. It's, uh, it's simple. It's, it's easy to recognize. But we don't really sell yeast. Um, at our plant there in Cedar Rapids, we utilize yeast as a microbial engine and we generate a fermentation with that, with that yeast using it as, a, as the engine of the process. And we tightly control um, that fermentation process, tightly, tightly control. And the end result is a, uh, through that process is a culture of different metabolites that when fed to, to livestock, and in this case, particularly to beef cattle, um, we see an improvement in, in production. And most of that stems from um, a, a healthier gut and being able to get more out of feed. And so I mentioned earlier, you know, we've been in business for uh, 80 years now. Uh, really for the first 70, we, we kind of about had one product and it was called uh, XPC. Uh, and, XPC yeast is what a lot of people call it, but the hallmarks of that product were um, better 
energy production in that gut and mostly stemming from better bug production. And we talked about the rumen earlier. Our, uh, our new uh, generation product is called Nature Safe and that builds upon XPC. Um, and, and really uh, it builds upon, you know, being able to get more energy out of feed. But really the main difference is that uh, we've been able to document that when fed to livestock, um, it kind of primes that immune system. And so, you know, when they're going through stressful uh, situations like weaning, um, like some weather challenges, then um, it, they're, they're better able to cope with that. And, uh, you know, we've been, um, it's been great to work with Vitalix and see the success that their customers have had utilizing that product, that product over the last several years. Thank you for going through and diving into that and explaining that so that we all have a better understanding, Zeb. You bet. Do you have any other final thoughts that you want to share, Zeb, or do you just kind of want to say? Um, I would just leave your listeners with, I know, uh, you know, we are experiencing record um, cattle prices right now, feeders, all-time highs, fat cattle, all-time highs, um, box beef, all-time highs, give, barring the, the COVID event there in 2020. But there's a lot of money uh, that it takes to raise these cattle. And you throw on um, 8 9% interest rates. I, I would just say don't be flippant um, with your decisions. Visit with somebody uh, that, uh, to Shay's point about um, – you can't be experts in everything. So whether that's an extension person, whether that's a nutritionist or a feed rep, um, you know, some of uh, these ingredient company representatives, um, you know, don't be afraid to ask for opinions and, and make sure to put, put numbers to, to what you're going to do. If you're, if you're looking to buy calves or retain calves, because if you're looking to retain them, um, you know, there's, there's, a, they're worth a lot of money the day you wean them. And so we just want to have to, I would just say, make sure to have a game plan going forward and some of the risk management tools with the LRP changes last year, um, maybe that's really attractive to you. Uh, so I just say, be cautious. Um, it's, a, it's an exciting time, but uh, boy, there's just a lot of dollars um, that are, that it's taking right now to, to make this cattle thing go. Absolutely. And we're, we're all about, um, increasing that profitability when we have tight margins. So, well, thank you both for being on the show today. I really appreciate you taking the time to share your experience and knowledge and uh, help break down the nutritional side of the weaning process for my listeners. Great to be here. You should. And that's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.